I'm Marshall Kozlov, and this is Arsenal of Democracy. Never before has our American civilization been in such danger as now, danger against which we must prepare. But we well know that we cannot escape danger by crawling into bed and pulling the covers over our heads. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. On today's episode, I'm joined by Dr. Meg Reese. Meg is the founder and CEO of Solid Intel, a company that uses artificial intelligence and generative AI overall to address vulnerabilities in the supply chain system. We also discuss the state of US foreign policy, where the leadership gap exists between the two parties, and how we should think about the defense tech space moving forward. We waited as long as possible to get into World War II. There was true evil in the world, and we waited as long as possible. Then we organized ourselves to finally get there. And I, I have faith that we as a people move very rapidly when we're forced to. And so even in all of these um, concerns that I have about this horizon, I'm convinced that we as the American public will move. We will understand. We will be able to art articulate who our adversaries are and appropriately move to to address what they're doing in the world. Um, but I do fear that without appropriate leadership, it will take us way longer and it will be a lot more costly to get there. Hope you all enjoy the conversation. Dr. Megan Reese, welcome to Arsenal of Democracy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm pumped to chat with you somehow, and by somehow I mean by design, We've avoided covering artificial intelligence on this podcast, mostly because it's important to separate hype, especially innovation hype, from the actual national security challenges we face. But you come from the D.C. policy world. You were Senator Mitt Romney's national security advisor. Now you have your own startup, Solid Intel. To what degree do you think AI is capable of serving as like a magic bullet for a bunch of national security problems that we're encountering as a country? Nothing can be a magic bullet. If we're expecting a magic bullet, we're putting our faith in something that doesn't exist. That being said, AI can be a very incredible tool for addressing the problems if we apply it correctly if we explore ways that we can use it for our national security interests. And I think that's what we need to spend a lot of time thinking about, exploring and putting some of the best minds to these challenges of thinking through what are the use cases and how do we make it work for us? So tell us about Solid Intel and how you're using AI um, and tech broadly to address the supply chain uh, problem, crisis, pick whichever word you want to describe it as that folks on this podcast are very interested in? Yeah. When I was thinking through what the applications of generative AI could be, I, of course, went directly to what are the national security implications. And I just wanted to spend time thinking about where could we use this kind of novel tool to our benefit? What are the use cases? How can we make it work? And I had been working in the Senate on a lot of supply chain issues, thinking through what supply chains mean for the China challenge in particular, and what they mean in the case of a Taiwan conflict scenario. And the the most egregious pain point that I saw was in supply chains, making sure that given the amount of integration between the U.S. and Chinese economies, they, they had the capacity to really interfere with our ability to maintain our supply chains both on the commercial side, but perhaps even more importantly on the military side and potentially interfere with what we want to do in ways that we'd want to aid Taiwan and our allies in the region. And so I really just went to some AI engineers and wanted to explore how can we use generative AI to understand where the threats in our supply chains are. And thus I started Solid Intel. And I think what's interesting here, because this is a policy podcast, what is the gap between, let's say we have the perfect version of your startup in five or six mm -hmm. years, we could see 
all the supply chains, generative AI really provides the transparency. What's the gap between having that knowledge and actually being able to do something about it? When it comes down to it, the gap between the knowledge and the action comes down to the individual users. On the commercial side, do folks want to just kind of delay the integration of these tools? Because knowing where the bad stuff lies, knowing that they have these Chinese SOEs could that could immediately uh, interfere with their supply chains, honestly, that's a scary problem. That's a tomorrow problem. And so you have people just delaying. On the DOD side, it's a little more concerning because we have a lot of timelines being put out by folks like the Indo-PACOM commander about when China would be militarily ready to invade Taiwan, blockade Taiwan, et cetera. And so in that case, you're wanting to align the timelines of the threat with the assurance that the supply chains will be ready to handle that threat. And I think there's a bit of a disconnect right now at DOD where the timelines are being said out loud, but the implementation of what those timelines mean are not being put in place at the speed they need to be. I recently interviewed you at a live event in San Francisco and you were focusing on the next year um, forward as a organizing point for action. Mm -hmm. Give your thinking, A, just like what about the world situation is convincing you that's a useful timeline, but also just like the idea of just having something much more actionable than these more later in the decade, maybe in the 2030s type of metrics. Yes, I think that we need to listen to what the Chinese are telling us. I I have this as a guiding principle across my life. If someone tells you what they want to do, just trust that that's what you should be focused on. So if the Chinese say we want to be ready to militarily take Taiwan by 2027, you prepare for that timeline. Well, the thing that we're seeing are a number of indicators that could be showing that they'd be ready even a little bit sooner. And so 2025 is when you want to have all of your policies in place, all of your technology being developed so that in the case that they are ready even sooner, you will have started to do best practices to get ready to defend, deter sooner. And here's the other thing, twenty, let's say 2025, we want to deter a conflict. This would be bad for humanity writ large if China decided to move on Taiwan. It would be bad economically, it would be bad militarily, it would be bad potentially potentially even health wise, we haven't seen them do good things in this space. And so we want to deter in order to deter, you have to be in a very strong position, we want to be able to say, and believe when we say to the Chinese that you should not do this because it will be bad for you in the end, for XYZ reasons. And we just want to make that happen as soon as possible. So I think this next year, we we need to put a ton of resources and a ton of capabilities in place so that we deter those later time timelines. So obviously coming from the national security space on the Hill, national security questions in the DOD are gonna be top of mind for you. But now if you're working in private industry and working at different companies, where is the mood on their end? Obviously, 2020, 2021, 2022, going into 2023, there was a lot of like narrative interest in the supply chains topic. But obviously, we've all seen at a big headlines level, at a sort of what's the industry focused on level, that get tamped down a bit for a variety of reasons. What's the overall mood? Because, you know, if you'd had this startup and the AI tech wasn't there, so it's okay. But if you had this startup in 2021, I think that would have been a much easier like customer facing situation than it is in 2024. Yeah, it's this funny thing where on the commercial side, industry went through this egregiously terrible time period during COVID. They understood the supply chain threat just inherently because it impacted their bottom line so egregiously. And now, as long as it's not an acute problem, industry tends not to like to think about it. So you have two different sets of leaders in in private business approaching supply chain problems. the I'd say the bigger set are those who are not directly impacted right now, which means they're not feeling the crackdown from new China regulations, and they're just gonna put off the problem as long as possible. And then you have these other groups that are being directly impacted by regulation coming out of the Senate and House. Um, you're having folks that have had, let's say, critical mineral 
controls be wrapped up as part of the export controls that China is putting in place, aeronautics equipment, et cetera. And they're recognizing actually China has the capacity to massively interfere with my bottom line and we have to deal with this problem immediately. And so you're having these two different groups. It's probably human nature that it works like that, that those who feel the problem are wanting to deal with it. Those who haven't felt the implications yet will just put it off, even though they live through through COVID and know exactly what it means in the long term. So to kind of take us into your pitch deck for a second, when you're encountering a company who is thinking around those dynamics, but it's going through that environment that you just described, what do you say to them? That, well, we're an early stage startup, right? So I'm going to the folks on, on the side that are dealing with the pain problems. And what we say to them is a couple of things. So we go through where an adversarial uh, country could interfere with their supply chains. Oftentimes we'll go through a, a basic search and show them, well, actually you have this SOE that China likes to put you know, a little, a little bit of pressure on here, or you have these capacities that could be interfered with through the Israel-Iran issues. And once you see this, here are, our alter here are our alternative suppliers. Here's an entire database that we have in our system where you can identify where suppliers are located whether or not they're less risky, and then identify exactly what parts they've imported into the U.S. with contact information and go forth, contact them. They're a good alternative to what you've been dealing with. Um, the best case is when we've actually been able to see new regulations come into place, have these folks in a pain point saying, would you have been able to see this interference of our supply chains before this new regulation came into place. And we, we were doing this for a customer the other day, and actually they had a Chinese SOE that ended up on an export control list. It interfered with their supply chains by six months, which for a startup, that's, that's egregiously long. And we were able to see that, no, we couldn't see that this company was, um, you know, selling their goods into Russia despite sanctions regulations. But what we could see is that same company was selling their dual use goods into Iran. And so even though we couldn't see what they got caught for, we could see that this is a company that you probably shouldn't have in your supply chains regardless. I'm curious to put your NSA hat back on for a second. What do you think the U.S. federal government's regulatory approach to the supply chains question should be overall? Because I think if we're, and this is something you and I always think on, I'd say my big critique of the federal effort um, from both parties in many degrees is the, is the inability to get everyone on the same page with a, this is the principle we have, this is what we're trying to accomplish here. So broadly speaking, like what should the federal regulatory approach be? It's it's a really tricky problem because honestly, at the moment, I do not care if you're importing certain plastic parts from the Chinese mainland. That's fine. It, it's not going to make a product work or not. It's not going to introduce risk in a real way. Um, what the U.S. regulatory bodies need to understand is that for every regulation that we put in place, assume that it's going to be implemented at the lowest common denominator in the sense that people are going to go up to the line and do the least they possibly can to make sure that they're checking the box. So if you're on the China Select Committee, if you're on SASC, if you're on SFRC, recognize that as you're writing the regulations, as you're writing new laws in this space, and you have this guiding principle of we need to make sure that the defense primes are um, understanding of their supply chains. We also need to make sure that all the suppliers into the defense primes are de-risking their supply chains. Know that as you write this legislation, they're going to do the least amount of work possible to do it. So you have to be incredibly explicit if you want it to happen at the level of intent. And speaking again to the policymaker background, we're using terms like de-risk. Um, what do you think the maximum amount of de-risking possible 
is given that constraint. So I don't need like an exact number, but just once again, from like an objective perspective, because to your point around plastics, let's say toys or something like that, mm-hmm. the aim of our policy isn't to say there is just zero dependence on China at all for any good whatsoever, given those constraints. So what do you think is the actual band of possibility when it comes to resiliency um, in the categories that really matter? Yeah, I think you're going to start with the purely commercial, not hitting these critical components, parts. And to do risk properly, you just really need redundancy. You need supply chains to exist in multiple places so that if China or different areas of the world end up being hotspots, then your business will not be interrupted long term and you'll be able to have continuity. The other thing that we need to do urgently, and we we are going through this process, but we're not going through it fast enough to meet these 2027 timeline horizons, is to have DOD and other parts of the U.S. government do really aggressive reviews to understand what they need in order to win any conflict scenario and make sure that they understand down to the critical mineral where those parts are coming from and get them out of supply chains where they know that they're going to be interrupted or at the very least create the redundancy so they have an appropriate level of supply to win. I think what's always interesting about speaking with you or to anyone who lives in this space is that when we're talking about supply chain dependence, if we're talking about the catastrophic worst case scenarios, we recognize as policymakers that that's a failure. If there is a conflict and you are running into these shortages in these critical materials, or they are capable of using control of that supply chain to really serve as a leverage point, something broadly speaking has already failed. So let's take a step forward before that failure point. What do you think we should be doing broadly to deter conflict uh, with China in the Indo-Pacific Um, actually, frankly, to the fact that you brought up Iran as a dual use, like use case, how should the U S just approach the question of deterrence in the 2020s? Well, honestly, we need to figure out what we're trying to deter here. Are we trying to deter solely a blockade, solely a 2027 invasion scenario, or are we trying to assert the continuity of the liberal world order and the fact that we're not going to allow authoritarian governments to take over the way the world works. Honestly, I think that we need to really grapple with ourselves about what what we are trying to preserve and then appropriately resource for that objective in mind. Um, And there's a whole lot of work to do there. I think we start with the smaller conflicts, the smaller potential conflicts, and make sure that we have all the capabilities in place. Um, And a lot of that is going to happen in the classified sphere because it's like, I don't know what Indo-PACOM wants to do or the Pentagon wants to do generally in that space. Um, But we want to make sure that you have that in mind, but also a broader, broader, strategy so that, you know, even beyond that first step, we know what we're building towards and we know what scaffolds we're putting in place to make sure that we don't lose this house that we've built over a gener- over generations. Something I'm curious about. So after you left government, you went into the world of, of startups and you focused on um, AI and then the intersection therein with um, supply chains. You could have also done something in the defense tech space, just given your, your your policy background. I'd just be curious, separate from your motivations for which spaces you ended into, I would love to hear where you feel defense tech, something this podcast covers a lot, mm-hmm. fits within this overall framework. Because my quick editorial offer here is I really appreciate you focusing on 2025 2027, let's focus on those timelines, because too often conversations that I have with defense tech folks are clearly about technologies, 
innovation cycles and processes that are going to be amazing and really impressive if they work in the 2030s, but they're not direct answers to the problem of 2027. Um, you know, I've yet to see a defense startup that's saying like, Hey, we've really solved the artillery, um, manufacturing issue. We could do it faster. We could do it cheaper. We could stand up the fabs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what's just your perspective on an adjacent space to yours, that being defense technology and what it can and can't do when it comes to serving as a tool for addressing the actual problem we're trying to solve? I, I think you've already hit the nail on the head. Um, the reason why I started Solid Intel and not a critical mineral consortium or something like that is because I wanted to do what I could to meet that first timeline. And I worry that both industry, um, defense tech, and honestly, the Pentagon are not appropriately aligning the timelines for the biggest threats. And any anytime someone says they want to bring a new technology online, but it's not going to be till 2035, you have to question how much they they really are trying to grasp through the the problem of the adversary that they claim they're building for. Um, and I, I really, really worry also that we haven't really built the structure at DOD to appropriately meet those timelines. So the more, the more money support funding, um, shortened funding cy cycles in the sense that getting stuff in quickly, um, the more you can do that, the more you shorten the timelines of the build. Right. And so you have all of these offices being stood up across DOD to make sure that you can bring new and emerging tech in as as fast as possible. But when it comes down to it, there are still so many regulatory, administrative and other hurdles that you're, you're not seeing um, DOD moving as if it would if it truly believed that the conflict was going to happen when in, in 2027 or sooner, um, people are kind of still, even with all of these innovative bodies saying they want to bring in great defense tech, they still seem to be kind of slow rolling the process. And I don't have a lot of faith that defense primes are going to do this innovation quickly either. And so you, you have a really um, failed aligning of priorities with implementation going on right now. And I think there are a number of different offices being stood up and different things like that at DOD where people are trying to force the issue as fast as possible. But I, I'll just say I remain hopeful that they're going to get there, um, but there's still a but at the end of that sentence. This is the meta topic I'm personally obsessed with, so I'm glad you brought it up. It seems if we look at all aspects of the arsenal of democracy, U.S. foreign policy, and the intersection with domestic policy conversations, so this includes the semiconductor chip fabs, a problem we have in this country is that after 10 years or so of discourse around like the U.S. and China, we've come to the place where narratively speaking, everyone feels comfortable saying, we're in a second Cold War style situation. Obviously, there's like little nitpicks there, but broadly speaking, that's less controversial than it's ever been. Um, it's not controversial to say Silicon Valley plays a big role in America's future when it comes to defense. And critically, the stakes could not be higher. Um, if you read your average New York Times, Wall Street Journal, or Bloomberg column, there'd be some reference to the idea that the international situation is as perilous as it was in the 1930s. But there's just such a gap between everyone narratively agreeing with those statements and the actual action and urgency that flows from that. I'd be curious, as a person who comes from academia, but also worked on the Hill, and then of course is now in the startup world, do you have a theory of the case for where the back, where, where the breakdown's happening here? Because that's just genuinely the thing that I'm always just very confused about. I'm not just asking that rhetorically. Like I'm, I'm legitimately, maybe it's just because I'm a podcaster, and by definition my job is to sort of sit above everything and make judgments on people, but I don't understand where the gap between rhetoric and action is. What's your take on the failure, failure mode here? Or, or am I incorrect that there's a failure mode here and actually life is just more complicated than just instantly snapping our figures and making things happening? 
I think it's just an egregious failure of leadership, unfortunately. Unless you have the people at the top who articulate the problem clearly and articulate where we're supposed to be headed, what the end game is if we win, what the end game is if we lose, and why we need to gather everyone to set real guideposts for a strategy in place, then all of the bureaucracy, all of the lack of motivation is going to overwhelm the race, right? Um, there, there are all of those statements that we, we, we are honestly a lazy people sometimes. And this is not to criticize Americans versus others. I, I think that it's just human nature to kind of stay in stasis until something forces you out of it. And what it comes down to is if you look at polling data, the leader of a party actually really doesn't have a lot of ways that they can sway the general population on domestic policy. Because when it comes down to it, most people have a lot of um, interaction with education policy or with certain types of economic policy. But when it comes to defense and foreign policy, they will move and they will sway with the leadership of their party. And so if you don't have a leader in your party who, who is going to articulate to you that we all need to move in this direction, and that comes both within the administration and for the general population, then they're, they're going to go with what the leader says. This is something that frustrates me as a Reaganite Republican, but we haven't had a Reaganite leader in a long time who has been able to articulate where the bad guys and where the good guys are, that we are the good guys. I'm going to abide by that statement going forward. Um, and that we need to win in this long-term um, political economic and military conflict scenario that we have brewing on the horizon. Um, we, we waited as long as possible to get into World War II. There was true evil in the world and we waited as long as possible. Then we organized ourselves to finally get there. And I, I have faith that we as a people move very rapidly when we're forced to. And so even in all of these um, concerns that I have about this horizon, I'm convinced that we as the American public will move, we will understand, we will be able to art articulate who our adversaries are and appropriately move to, to address what they're doing in the world. Um, but I do fear that Without appropriate leadership, it will take us way longer and it will be a lot more costly to get there. So I'll give you an opportunity to be a pox on both houses then. So if I were to explain for the Biden administration, they would say, look, what, we passed the CHIPS Act. We're backing Ukraine. We're serious about Taiwan. What's the gap between their version of the story they tell about themselves and their policies and the call to leadership that you're making. And then we'll cover the Republicans in a second. Oh my goodness. Um, I, I'll, I'll try to be relatively kind to people because I think that most people in both the Biden administration and the Trump administration, they go into public service to actually try to do good. Um, and so I'm going to preface this as I have friends and colleagues in both administrations that I am so grateful to them for doing the good work of trying to write our approach to the China challenge. That being said, I think there are a lot of people kind of scared of their own shadows who cannot and are absolutely unwilling to articulate our adversaries to be able to say what they fear could end up happening and then try to appropriately resource so that we do not let those challenges come to fruition. I don't know. I, I kind of understand why they're scared of doing it. They don't want to unintentionally 
kick off those challenges, kick off those adversaries and give them a quote unquote excuse. But think about what we did when it came to Ukraine. Um, I, I'm so grateful that we managed to get our allies together to put sanctions in a really robust way on Russia. But the fact that we withdrew our capabilities from the Black Sea because we were afraid that it would incite Russia to invade Ukraine is an insane statement. We don't make our we cannot make ourselves weaker out of fear that we will incite our adversaries. And I think that's a bit what this administration has done in a couple of different places around the world. And then coming from the rights perspective, I'd be curious because you specifically identify yourself as a Reaganite. Um, I just had um, Dr. Matt Kronig and Dan Nagara on the podcast where they talked about their new book, We Win, They Lose, which was focused on the idea that you have this Trump-Reaganite fusionism that has emerged from this period. Um, as an explicit Reaganite then, how confident are you that if Trump wins in November, there is a stable consensus that can move forward within the bands of, of I'm sure what you'd be comfortable with policy wise? Oh, I, I do not feel overly comfortable that this is a true fusion. I think there's a lot of um, various policies, various views and ideology that are in the current Trump world and orbit. Um, a J.D. Vance is very different in national security and foreign policy than Robert O'Brien or Mike Pompeo. They understand the world differently. They understand our allies differently. Some of them actually believe that our allies are bad for us, that they don't diffuse the cost, which is actually what happens, that our ability to act in multiple parts of the world is somehow bad. Um, and then you have other folks who really are a, a reflection of a long tradition of Reaganite strength. And figuring out what this administration would look like, who will be elevated or not, um, is, you know, it's, it's a DC parlor game, but it's also a long term concern for what the future of the US and the world looks like. So for the final question here, um, as, as I said at the start of the episode, I have avoided the AI topic just because not even skepticism of AI, but just real um, wariness of not just overhyping something that's particularly fashionable. But I think it's critical to be said here, you with your policy background are very optimistic around AI. So I'd like you to do two things here. So one, can you just give us your bull case for why national security focused folks should be excited about AI? Mm -hmm. And then B, how should they then though cut through the hype and press releases that are being very, very directly aimed at them right now as folks try to justify their valuation. So why are you excited? But how do people who then are excited as you are sort through, you know, sort the wheat from the chaff? Oh, absolutely. So Scale AI and some of these other big companies um, have a vision for the use of AI in the defense world that I think is absolutely necessary. So the Pentagon has just so much data right now, right? We, we have so much data in so many different types of formats, and we need that data to talk to each other for a lot of different reasons. Um, it's the intelligence side, it's the targeting side, it's it's knowing where things are, how to use them best. Um, are there things that we're not seeing with the naked eye that if we put enough data to the problem, it's going to pop up potential solutions or potential optionalities that we thought there was only one option in place. And I think there's a lot in this space that, that has that. It's going to make some of our technology better, our deep tech work better, Better, um, our defense tech work better, but um, there, there's, there is reason to be skeptical, right? So let's 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 say that we are approaching a conflict scenario, and when it comes down to it, it's certain challenges are not going to be data problems. They're going to be the fact that we need to build up our arsenals very, very, very fast. We need to do dumb tech very, very, very fast. We need to have munitions in place. And we have the money to do that quickly. 
AI and different types of data will help potentially make these processes more efficient, but they're not going to replace the the actual literally bullets that need to go into guns. Um, and then the other thing I'd say to the folks in, who have overhyped is you have people who really don't know national security making the calls on who to invest in. And they don't know how to appropriately gauge whether or not dual use has an application in DOD or whether or not DOD is willing to put money to certain types of applications. Um, DOD is very skeptical in a lot of ways for certain types of AI, and they're putting a lot of regulations to make sure well, that in the end could make it so that only the biggest players actually can cross those hurdles of uh, regulatory compliance. And so as people invest in this space, they need to really talk to as many folks at DOD as they can to understand where the money is going and how they can help their startups actually win, or else they're going to be investing in things that sound good on paper, but DOD, if DOD doesn't want to buy it, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, I think that there is just so much enthusiasm in Silicon Valley still, even as some of the numbers of funding are going down, you have brilliant people really trying to address problems. But it's a lot of people who have never actually worked in the defense space. You have a lot of 24-year-old kids who have a vision of how to develop a drone and how to use data to do it well. And they just need a little bit of guidance and VCs may actually be able to help in that space. So make sure that DOD wants to buy what you're building or help convince them that they should buy what you're building. Um, and then understand that all use cases, even the, the best vision may not get across the finish line. Perfect place to end some optimism, but some needed gut checking. Dr. Meg Reese, thanks for joining us on Arsenal of Democracy. Thank you, Marshall. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe below so you don't miss any episodes of Arsenal of Democracy. If you'd like to learn more about the topics covered on this episode or just are interested in broader content on U.S. foreign and domestic policy, be sure to go to Hudson.org. See you soon.